In this video, we'll look at how TCP implements congestion control, including explicit congestion notification, and we'll look at the idea of TCP fairness. Let's get started. We'll now look at the complex and sometimes controversial topic of TCP congestion control. The basic mechanism used for TCP congestion control is AIMD, or Additive Increase Multiplicative Decrease, meaning that senders gradually increase the rate of sending to see how fast they can send before the network won't be able to support it anymore. And when they do detect congestion, they back off rapidly. So graphing the sending rate over time, it looks something like this, with linear periods of increase followed by rapid decreases. This is implemented by increasing the window size by one MSS every round trip time until a loss event is detected. So the multiplicative decrease part is cutting the window size in half each time a packet is lost. This is referred to as a sawtooth pattern, which represents TCP probing to see how much bandwidth is available in the network. Depending on the version of TCP, the indication that loss has occurred is slightly different. In the earlier version, TCP Tahoe, there were only timeouts available to indicate that a packet was lost. And at that time, the window size was always cut to one MSS, no matter how large it had gotten at the time that the loss was detected. This was later updated by TCP Reno, which cuts the window size in half when loss is detected and uses the triple duplicate act method to detect that a loss has occurred. The AIMD algorithm has some desirable properties. One is that it can be implemented in a completely distributed manner. So the network does not have to coordinate the increase and decrease events. It also has desirable stability properties, which was necessary after earlier versions of TCP resulted in network collapse due to not reducing their sending rates enough when congestion occurred. So back to our sender buffer. We see that our window is now referred to as the congestion window. And where before we just talked about it in terms of n bytes, now that size will change depending on the inferred congestion properties of the network. It still starts after the last byte act, we have our in-flight packets and the number of the last byte sent, and then any available space in the window. So the congestion window says that the difference between the last byte sent and the last byte act must be less than the congestion window. So the sending behavior of TCP is to send roughly the number of bytes in the congestion window, and then it must wait a round trip time for the acknowledgements to come back, at which point it can send more bytes. So the congestion window over the round trip time will be the average sending rate of the TCP flow. Then there's the question of how to set the initial congestion window. So the initial congestion window can be set to one MSS, but if it could only add one MSS every round trip time, the TCP flow would ramp up very slowly. So instead, TCP slow start implements an exponential increase of the congestion window size. And it does this by doubling the congestion window every round trip time instead of adding one. In practice, the congestion window is incremented by one MSS for every acknowledgement received. If we track this, we can see sending one segment and getting one ACK, which increases our congestion window by one. So now we can send two packets and get two ACKs, each of which increases the congestion window by one. So then we can send four packets and then eight packets and so on. So slow start is a little bit of a misnomer because it ramps up much more quickly than additive increase multiplicative decrease would. If we were to plot the congestion window, which correlates to the sending rate over time, we can see it doubling with each round trip time and then switching over to the additive increase congestion avoidance phase of TCP. This transition happens when the congestion window reaches the SS threshold, the slow start threshold. In the event of a loss, the SS threshold is reduced to half the value of the congestion window from before the loss event. Comparing TCP Reno versus TCP Tahoe, we see that TCP Tahoe after the loss event reduces its congestion window to one MSS and then goes back through slow start until it reaches the SS threshold whereas TCP Reno just drops down to the SS threshold, which is also half the congestion window, and increases linearly from there. We can also look at this in terms of a finite state machine. While in slow start, we see that every time a new ACK arrives, the congestion window is increased by one MSS. However, if there's a timeout, we retransmit the missing segment, set the SS threshold to C window over two, and go back to a congestion window of one MSS. When the congestion window exceeds the slow start threshold, we move over to the congestion avoidance state. Now the congestion window is increased much more slowly each time a new act is received, and we keep track with a counter for any duplicate acts received. If there's a timeout, we move out of congestion avoidance and back to slow start. However, if our duplicate act count exceeds three, we retransmit the missing segment but go into a new state called fast recovery. During fast recovery, we continue to increase the congestion window as new segments arrive. 
Once we start getting new acts instead of duplicate acts, we can go back to the congestion avoidance phase. Slow start can also move to the fast recovery phase if it experiences triple duplicate acts. However, if there's a timeout during the fast recovery state, it will transition back to slow start. Note that throughout this, the event of a timeout is considered an indication of much more severe congestion than a triple duplicate act. More recent versions of TCP have continued to build on this mechanism. TCP cubic is the TCP variant typically used in Linux today. The intuition is that the sending rate at which loss is experienced probably has some consistency over time. And if this is true, TCP can have a higher bandwidth utilization by transmitting close to that rate more of the time. So in TCP cubic, after cutting the rate by half, it ramps up quickly and then levels off around the Wmax rate. The increased area under the curve between the blue dashed line and the solid red line indicates increased bandwidth utilization. But we're not done. When TCP cubic reaches Wmax, it begins increasing more aggressively again. The intuition here is that a temporary congestion event may have passed and there may be far more bandwidth available at a later point in time. So while the sending rate hovers for a while near the previous maximum rate, if still no loss event is detected, it begins to probe much more aggressively than the AIMD mechanism would. So this allows TCP cubic to more quickly adapt to an increase in available bandwidth. So as I mentioned, TCP cubic is the typical TCP version for Linux, which is the operating system that hosts most of today's websites. So what's happening in the network as TCP changes its sending rate? Well, it's continually increasing the rate until some loss occurs at a bottleneck in the network. And as we know, that occurs when the buffer is filled. Since whichever link on the path has the least available bandwidth will become the bottleneck, this is the one to focus on when understanding congestion. So increasing the TCP sending rate can't force any more data through this bottleneck. It can only support what it supports. However, due to queuing delay, increasing the sending rate will increase the round trip time as the queue on the bottleneck link continues to fill. So in the ideal case, where we want to maximize bandwidth utilization but minimize delay, we would keep the bottleneck link full but not continue adding packets to the queue. This leads us to another way that we can implement congestion control, which is called delay-based congestion control. TCP can keep track of its measurements of the round trip time, and in particular, track the RTT minimum. Remember that only certain parts of the delay are variable. Things like the speed of light do not change over time, but queuing delay does. So the minimum RTT observed is going to be the closest RTT to the path delay without queuing delay. The maximum throughput then that the sender could achieve is the congestion window over the minimum RTT. You can then measure its throughput by the number of bytes sent divided by the measured RTT. If the measured throughput is close to the maximum achievable throughput, then TCP can continue gradually increasing its sending rate. However, if the measured throughput is lower, this means that the round trip time is increasing indicating congestion on the path and that the sender should reduce its sending rate. Note that this is not a multiplicative decrease though, it is a linear decrease, leading to a much smoother sending rate than the AIMD mechanism. This has two major advantages. One is that it does not require packets to be lost to indicate congestion. As we saw, packet loss is a cause of inefficiency in the network because the lost packets consumed resources before they were dropped and the sender must consume additional bandwidth to retransmit the lost packets. It also allows the sender to have greater utilization by keeping its sending rate close to the maximum available bandwidth. This approach was initially discussed in TCP Vegas. However, that was not widely deployed in any operating system kernel. Google, however, does take this approach on a TCP deployed in their backbone network, known as BBR. Another approach is to use network-assisted congestion control. While TCP can only guess about whether or not the network is congested, the network layer knows what the state of its queue is. In order to make this work, there are two bits in the IP header, meaning the network layer header, as well as the two bits that we saw before in the TCP header. The network operator must adopt some policy to enable marking the bits in the IP header. If the bits are set to 1,0 in the IP header, that means that it is an ECN-capable endpoint, so it will take action based on the explicit congestion notification bits. As that packet traverses the network, a router can mark the second bit as a 1, meaning congestion has been experienced as that segment passed through the network. At the receiver side, the congestion experienced bit is set in the TCP header of the acknowledgement, and in that way it can make it back to the sender, which can then reduce its sending rate. This is what we call a cross-layer mechanism, because it's involving both the network layer and the transport layer working together. As with the delay-based congestion control, this mechanism works without packets being dropped, the router can observe that its buffer is increasing above some threshold and begin marking packets proactively. One of the goals of the TCP protocol is fairness. 
meaning that when multiple flows are sharing a bottleneck link, they should each get the same share of the available bandwidth. So if we have k flows sharing r bandwidth, each flow should get r over k on average. So we can show this on a graph. The two axes are the throughput of our two connections, and the red dot is the current operating point. In this case, we can see that connection 1 has much more of the bandwidth than connection 2. As both connections operate in AIMD, they will each linearly increase their share of the bandwidth. However, when they attempt to send more than the total amount of bandwidth available, loss will occur and they will both perform multiplicative decrease. When that happens, the operating point gets closer to achieving a fair share of bandwidth between the two flows because they both cut by half, which means the one with a greater share of the flow also reduced by more than the one that had less of the bandwidth. This continues with additive increase and multiplicative decrease, bringing them closer and closer to a fair share. While we explain this showing two flows, it works with multiple flows as well. So there's a number of assumptions here, but in general, TCP will achieve a relatively fair distribution of available bandwidth. However, applications using UDP don't have this notion of fairness, and say, so they won't back off and share bandwidth with TCP flows. Also, anyone could create their own protocol that does not have these fairness properties. Another way in which TCP may be unfair is if one application uses multiple flows and another application uses only one. Each TCP flow will get the same share of the bandwidth, and so an application with two flows would get twice as much bandwidth as an application with one flow. This is quite common with web browsers as they retrieve multiple objects from multiple servers. That completes our discussion of all of the basic mechanisms that make TCP work. In the next video, we'll see the evolution of functionality that has occurred over time through TCP and beyond. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.